Welcome back Defenders, Jake here. Today's video, my voice might be a little off because I'm currently battling a head cold. We're going to take it slow. I've got my tea right here. We're going to power through today's video because this is important. President Zelensky announces the dismissal of Defense Minister Reznikov. Now, I personally really like Defense Minister Reznikov. I think he's a good guy. But I'm only seeing him as an outsider. I am not an expert on Ukraine's internal politics. I don't actually know the guy. But there have been these reports the last six months of some of his lieutenants engaging in corruption, overcharging for food, overcharging for uniforms, possibly making this money disappear. Reznikov himself has not been implicated. It's been people underneath him. But he's the guy in charge. He's the one that sets the tone. He establishes the culture of what is acceptable and not acceptable. So given that we're a year and a half into this war, it's not uncommon to change leadership roles. But you know who never changes leadership roles? The Russians. Given the, the blatant corruption engaged by people like Shoigu and Gerasimov, they're not getting fired. They're not getting replaced. Russia is doing nothing different, given how terrible this war is going, and given how much Shoigu has obviously been stealing from the Russian treasury. So Reznikov is going to be replaced by this man, 41-year-old Crimean Tatar Rustem Umarov. He's currently the head of the state property fund. And I looked at his Wikipedia page. He doesn't have any military experience, but that's okay. Defense minister is a political post. This guy is going to be meeting with other secretaries of defense or defense ministers, heads of state. Uh, General Zaluzny is still the commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces. He's still conducting the war. All war operations are continu continuing uh, seamlessly. Analysis, a man for all seasons. Zelensky's choice as Minister of Defense, Rustem Umarov. So this is a very fascinating pick. Uh, this guy has served in Ukraine's parliament for a couple years. Very active, very intelligent, uh, very well liked. And you might have put it together that he's an ethnic Tatar. And given that Ukraine is going to be liberating Crimea, this man has the opportunity to help liberate his homeland. His family was deported uh, by Stalin and the Russians uh, 50 years ago. 200,000 ethnic Tatars were relocated to Central Asia forcibly. Many of them died. Uh, so Russia engaged in a genocide, an ethnic cleansing of the Crimean Peninsula in order to move in ethnic Russians. So I see what Zelensky is uh, doing here, uh, giving this guy the job. He has the potential to build closer ties between Ukraine and, for example, Turkey. Turkey uh, has historical and ethnic ties with the Tatars indigenous to Crimea. And given that this guy is Muslim, can't hurt if he uh, makes some trips to wealthy countries such as Saudi Arabia asking for additional assistance. Maybe Saudi Arabia could pump a little bit more oil in order to help weaken the Russians. So this is astonishing. Ukraine now has a Jewish president and a Muslim minister of defense. This is the evil Nazi country that Russia is trying to depict the Ukrainian people as. I can only smile and laugh. This is so absurd what Russia is claiming. So what is Putin and the Russians up to? And Turkish President Erdogan flew to Sochi, Russia. This is on the Black Sea in order to meet with Putin to talk about the uh, Black Sea grain deal. Потом мы все 
Erdogan's an interesting guy, and Putin does look happy to see him. Now, according to the Russians, the negotiations were constructive. Erdogan and Putin talked to each other for over three hours. But in reality, these talks are foolish. They're never going to go anywhere. Putin has given a list of demands in order to return to the Black Sea grain deal. He wants their agricultural bank reconnected to SWIFT. He wants spare parts for agricultural machinery. He wants to unblock transportation, logistics, and insurance. And he wants this ammonium pipeline that's, that runs through Ukraine to Odessa to be unfrozen and reconnected. This pipeline has been damaged because Russia invaded Ukraine. I don't see how Russian repair crews will be allowed to enter a war zone in order to fix this pipe. So Putin has deliberately given a list of demands he know Ukraine is never going to agree to because the goal is global famine. Here's the statement from Kuliba. Russia's demands for relaunching the grain deal are blackmail. Ukraine knows this. Russia knows this. Maybe even Erdogan knows this. But Russia is losing this war, and they're willing to gamble big. So Russia has plenty of food. They're not going to go hungry. Ukraine has plenty of food. They're not going to go hungry. The goal is to cause political turmoil in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Cause food, food prices to spike. Maybe some political instability. Maybe a refugee crisis. People heading to Europe. This is Putin's master plan to destabilize the West and have them give up their support for Ukraine. And while Putin and Erdogan were meeting in Sochi, Russia, Russia decided to launch a massive drone strike on Ukrainian ports in southwestern Ukraine. Uh, and Russia's willing to once again take huge risks and gamble big. And when they attack these Ukrainian ports on the Danube River, this is Romanian territory, this is NATO. And we were expecting this, it finally happened. A Russian drone landed on Romanian territory and exploded. Bucharest denies Ukrainian claim that Russian drone hit Romanian territory. A Ukrainian official on Sunday posted a photograph, he said, showed that a Russian Shahid drone hit Romanian territory. Another statement from uh, Kuliba, It's pointless to deny drones fell in Romania. Yet Romania and NATO are going to deny that a Russian drone landed on Romanian territory. So the question is why. I know in the comment section people are going to ask this. Why does NATO keep denying when Russia causes these provocations? The missiles that landed in Poland that killed two farmers, uh, the Russians who downed that sur American surveillance drone over the Black Sea. And I'll link this video down below from friend of the channel, Anders Puck Nielsen, why, th why the West is not reacting to Russian attacks. And the summary of this video, it's fantastic. Anders is a uh, Danish naval officer, but the West is choosing to do nothing because Russia's military is currently being destroyed. What is NATO's response? And this graphic right here is NATO's response. NATO is going to continue supporting Ukraine and giving them the military aid they need to destroy the Russian military. So why would Romania and NATO deny that this drone landed in the woods on Romanian territory, and it's because there's no benefit to making a political incident out of it, given that maybe that's what Russia wants. Russia wants NATO to overreact, make a bunch of noise, uh, so they can go to their own people saying, look, NATO is uh, threatening us. But on the battlefield, the Russians continue getting their asses kicked. Defense Ministry reports gains in Donetsk and the Zaporizhia oblasts. So over the last couple days, the Ukrainian military has released a couple spectacular videos of Russian losses. This video is from the Kherson region, in which a Russian patrol boat, KS-701, 
was unloading supplies on the beach when it was annihilated by a Bayraktar TB2 drone. There's another video also released in the last two days showing a Urals truck about to be uh, kaputted once again by a Bayraktar TB2 drone. So it's been a while since we've seen some spectacular videos of the TB2 drone uh, striking Russian positions. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they both happened in this uh, western part of the Kherson Oblast. The reason why is Russia's air defense systems keep being destroyed, and it's starting to thin out in this region of the occupied territories. Ukraine is feeling more confident flying a drone, such as the TB2, in this region to strike Russian positions given that their air defense systems keep becoming weaker in this region. So I think this is fascinating that uh, this is proving to be a, a weak point for the Russian military. And they're going to have to make a decision soon because it's becoming harder and harder to control this sparsely populated... There's not, it's just, just not a lot of good cover in this area with all these beaches, and they're still forcing their soldiers to camp out there. Here is an insane video. It's 2 minutes and 20 seconds long. I'll link it down below if you want to see it. But this is in the Verbova region. So this is Zaporizhia. And the Russians brought in these troops with dozens of soldiers to reinforce Verbova. They did this during the daytime, and they were spotted by a Ukrainian reconnaissance drone so the Ukrainians unloaded their cluster munitions on this concentration of soldiers. Once again, 2 minutes and 20 seconds. I'll link it down below, but they took a lot of casualties in this strike. Let's check in with that Russian Mi-8 helicopter pilot that defected to Ukraine last week, and he sat down for an interview. I don't want to be an accomplice of crimes. Ukrainian military intelligence and a Russian military helicopter pilot planned the dramatic defection for six months, yielding a helicopter and lots of classified information in Operation Titmouse. This guy defecting was labeled Operation Titmouse. And we don't have translations of the interview yet. He seems like a good guy. He's wearing a Ukrainian t-shirt here. He did get his family out of Russia. They're now in Ukraine with him. I don't really know what to think of this guy. Uh, there are speculations that he wants to join the Ukrainian military. I don't think it needs to go that far. He is going to be given $500,000. So is he motivated by doing what's right? Or is he motivated by... $500,000 and not dying in Putin's war of aggression. Either way, whatever. Uh, he gave up a helicopter, he stood down, and he wanted to sit down for this interview because this is golden propaganda. Get this on the internet and have other Russian pilots especially see this clip. Let them know that if they want to stay alive and they want to get filthy rich, all they have to do is steal a jet or steal a helicopter and then defect to Ukraine. That's what I would do. So with everything going bad for Russia, let's check in on the mother of RT News, Margarita. It's been a while since I've shown you a clip of her speaking, but she's still orange. Конечно, мы живем не в той атмосфере, в которой даже год назад мы каждое утро просыпаемся и ждем новостей, что там случилось за ночь. В Крыму, в Апатории Черного моря, с мостом. А какие еще беспилотники летали над нашими городами? У меня практически во дворе на средних улицах дважды за неделю беспилотник упал. That's hilarious. In my yard, practically, in the neighboring streets, Ukrainian drones have fallen down twice in a week. Well, this is our new reality. So we've gone from a special limited military operation in which Kyiv will be taken in three days Two Ukrainian drones have attacked my neighborhood twice in the last week. Margarita did continue, and I want to read this for you guys. She states, In the meantime, we continue to wage the most difficult 
and I insist that this is the most difficult, the toughest, and generally unprecedented war in our history, in the history of all of Russia. So this special limited military operation is the most difficult war that Russia has ever faced? It is the most difficult and the toughest because it is the first war in our history in which we have no allies at all. You hear that, BRICS? You're not real allies. China, India, South Africa, Brazil, Iran, <laughs> and Belarus. I'm sorry, you're a fake country. You don't count as an ally. But what about this guy? Kim Jong-un to visit Russia for arms deal with Putin in late September. So you've got the original kimchi commando, rocket man himself, the deer eater, making a trip, probably a 36-hour train ride, to Moscow to visit with Putin so that they can sell them some artillery rounds back that they bought from the Soviets in the 1980s. The jokes write themselves on this channel, guys. Russia is using tires to protect its bombers from aerial attack. Arranging surplus tires atop Russian bombers is likely a highly makeshift countermeasure used to thwart Ukrainian long-range drones and missile attacks. So we've gone from cope cages on top of armored vehicles to cope tires on top of their planes parked 700 kilometers deep inside Russian territory. Oh my god. This is crazy. As a new school term starts in Russia, children in Crimea are being invited to go hungry and donate their lunch money to the war efforts. This sign in a cafeteria in Crimea states, School pizza costs 100 rubles. The life of a soldier is priceless. The Russian military is literally stealing money, lunch money, from children to fight this war. Sorry, special military operation. Here's an interesting document that surfaced in the last two days. I'm pretty confident that this document is a forgery, it's a fake. It states that 200,000 men will be force mobilized uh, after Russia's regional elections on September 10th. But this is a, this is a double bind. So this document is currently circulating on social media, panicking Russian men. And even though it's a fake, the Russian government can't really deny it. They can't go on record saying that it's a forgery, because we all know they're planning to do this anyways. I don't think the document is real, but yes, Russia is going to mass mobilize hundreds of thousands of Russian men after the September 10th uh, regional elections. And it's election season in Ukraine. If you live in the occupied territories and you want to vote, this nice man with a machine gun and a mask will come to your door, uh, and you will fill out your ballot in front of him, and then put it in this transparent box. You're not allowed to fold it. Everyone needs to see how you voted, but it's going to go in this case and... This uh, nice man with a machine gun is going to wish you a pleasant day. Let's follow up on the story of uh, Ukrainians in the city of Kharkiv having to build classrooms underground in the metro stops. The city of Kharkiv has been bombed and shelled by the Russians continuously for a year and a half. So Ukraine said we have to keep our children underground during school hours. Honestly, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, I'm sure children would appreciate fresh air and sunlight while in school, but given that a war is going on, this is an uh, acceptable compromise in the short term. Here's a both sad and inspiring story. Uh, this 12-year-old girl here, her name is Yana, and she survived the Russian missile strike on the Kramatorsk rail station last year. This rail station strike killed 63 civilians, including 9 children. 
in the strike, she lost uh, both of her legs. And to inspire other children, she participated in a half marathon in Ukraine. So here is a clip of her, I think only running part of the marathon, but still pretty incredible. <laughs> Twelve years old. Final clip I have for you is a memorial put up by the youth of the city of Dnipro, honoring the memory of the children who have been killed by the Russians since the start of the war. The official count is only 503 because we don't have reliable data or information from the occupied territories, such as the city of Mariupol. The number of children killed by the Russian military is easily in the thousands. But let me share this, uh, this video with you. Each paper airplane represents the life of a child. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. Comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.